All right. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> we missed the countdown this morning, but three, two, one. <laughs> We're here, and what a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's stand together and worship, and I just really want to focus on the hope that we have in Christ. And I've been thinking a lot about how that extends so much more than, like, eternity. Like, we have the hope of eternity in heaven one day, but that hope of Christ also extends to our day-to-day. Um, God is so present with us. He's not distant. Um, so we're going to celebrate that this morning. Let me get my cape on the right. Mm-hmm. So sorry. Okay. <laughs> How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Imagine. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross, the cross has spoken. I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, breath has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. That beautiful morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me let's sing that again then came the morning then came the morning let seal the promise your buried body Begin to breathe, and out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Never again, Jesus, yours is the victory. Whoa, and hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost 
its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope and hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope oh god you are my living hope that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the Savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we bow the one who wore our sin and shame now open majesty the radiance of perfect love now shines for all to see your name your name is victory all praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. He that held us now gives way to him who gives our peace. His final breath upon the cross it is now alive in me. Yeah. Your name, your name, your name is victory all praise will rise to christ our king your name your name is victory and all praise to rise to christ our king Spirit. And by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected key is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Where soldiers watched in vain Was borrowed for three days His 
body there would not be. Our God has brought Our God has robbed the grave. Your name, your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. And all praise will rise to Christ our King. You may be seated. All right, good morning, New Gardeners. So glad that you've chosen to spend your Sunday morning with us today. Um, I know that there's a lot going on in our world, uh, things that uh, we hear, things that we see, things that might uh, make us feel like, man, is there hope for this world? Um, but I'm glad that this morning we have a place where we can come together and be hopeful, uh, that we have a group of people that we can find safe harbor in, and we can remind each other that Christ is the only king that we have. The only king that lasts. And so this morning, I'm glad that we can remember that. Um, glad to be back with you. I know last week, uh, Madeline and I and our youth group students were gone. We were in Gatlinburg at Winterfest with about uh, 3,000 teenagers um, who were all there for the same reason, to worship God together. And so it was a really awesome weekend. Uh, so that was really fun. But we are glad to be back with you again. Um, if this is your first time here, your second time, third time, maybe you just haven't done this before, but you can fill out a connection card. Uh, that's going to be at the front table. Uh, just name, email, basic information. And you get to designate uh, a charity on there that we will do donate $10 to. And so this is just an easy way for you to connect with us a little bit and for us to do a little bit of good. Um, and so it's an awesome way to get to know us more if that's something you're interested in. Uh, you can fill out a card at the front table and get it to me, get it to Jeff, get it to someone wearing a New Garden t-shirt, um, and it will get to where it needs to go. So uh, thank you so much for being here this morning once again. Um, we have something coming up, and it's kind of, it's kind of special, okay? Um, and so uh, right now I'm going to talk about New Garden's birthday, okay? So New Garden Church... That's us, okay? Uh, now, we, we've been a, a group of people for a long time, but it is year, it's about to be year five because we're turning four on Sunday, April 3rd. So, yeah, that's really exciting, uh, isn't it? Just like, it's so nice that we get to remind each other that, hey, this thing is, is still happening. This thing is growing, and it's just really special. Uh, whether you've been... Uh, part of our church for a few weeks or uh, 50 years, uh, I think it's going to be a really special day as we get to come together, share a meal. Uh, we're going to invite some teachers, faculty from uh, DuPont Tyler to come celebrate with us um, because once again, it's our birthday, but we want to be people who, when it's something good for us, we want to be something good for someone else. We're going to provide some gifts for teachers. It's going to be really special. There's going to be food. You might want to invite a friend because uh, it is a birthday party after all, right? And so um, it's going to be really fun, and I hope that you'll join us. So that Sunday, we won't have this type of worship gathering, uh, but we'll be uh, together. We'll be taking communion and, and having just a, a good morning celebrating uh, the good that God has done in us and in our community over the past four years. So it's going to be a really special day. Um, the next two weeks after this, uh, before our worship gathering, we are going to get together to pray together. And so uh, you might know that uh, you know, our church, we're, we're trying to figure out what God has for us. And I think that's something that we all go through every day in our lives, every year of our lives. And it's something that we get to center uh, our hearts around uh, and, and try to discern what God is calling us to in this space uh, with this group of people. And so if that's something that you want to participate in, uh, that's going to be 
uh, the next two Sundays from about 10 after 9 to about 9.45. We're just going to come together. We're going to pray, um, pray, read scripture together, uh, ask God to show us what God has for us uh, as this group of people, as uh, a people in this community. And so uh, I, would, I would just like to invite you personally to join us for that. I think it's going to be a really good time of, of praying together. Um, another thing, we've got six mobile food pantries this year. And so you can go ahead and put these dates in your calendar. The first one is actually getting close now that I'm starting to think about it. That is, that is like two months from uh, Wednesday. So pretty exciting stuff. Uh, that's, that's awesome. And now I'm going to go back to something that was on the screen before. So this is going to be a little bit tricky for our tech team. But you can check in on Facebook, or tag your location on Instagram. And all of those are going to help build a school for kids in need um, through an organization called Build On. If that's something that you're interested in, interested in uh, that organization, uh, I invite you to check out their website. You can just Google Build On, probably buildon.org, something like that. Um, and just to see all the great work that they're doing and stuff that we get to partner with. And why do we do all of these things that I just mentioned very quickly? For one reason, and we've been singing about it this morning, because our hope is built in Jesus, the cornerstone of our faith. Jesus is alive. That grave is empty. We get to be here together this morning. Um, and so um, as uh, Lily leads us in worship some more. Uh, we are going to our kids, Madeline and I, our Sprouts volunteers, we're going to head out that back door, and we're going to have an awesome time in kids' worship today. So um, all that said, I'll pray for us, and we'll continue on. So let's pray. Uh, Lord, we come before you this morning, and um, there's so many things going on in our world, uh, so many things going on in each of our lives, and um, God, we're thankful that we have a group of people and a place to be uh, to remind each other of you, God, um, to, to help us have hope that there is a future for us, there is a future uh, for this world that is free of war and all these other things that try to steal our joy. God, and these, these competing things, God, we just want to make you the king and the master of our lives. So we come before you this morning, and we just ask that you'll provide a message for us, a message of hope and reconciliation. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we continue in worship this morning, I want to invite you to worship however you need to, whether that's standing or um, just sitting and reflecting, um, whatever you need to do this morning. But I want to introduce a new song. Um, new to us, I think, anyways. But I was just thinking about all this going on in the world. And um, in the book of Amos, he talks about letting justice roll down like a river. And um, this song references that passage. So this is just a call for, for justice, to ask God to help us to be people who um, stand for, for what's right, who um, walk in love towards others and I just encourage you to to pay attention to these words because um, I think that it really struck me just thinking about what our world is facing today. So let's worship together. When you move, darkness runs for cover. When you move, no one's turned away. Cause where you are, fear turns into praises. Where you are, no hearts left unchanged. So come, move, let justice roll on like a river. Let worship. 
worship turn into revival Lord lead us back to you when you move the outcast finds a friend when you move the orphan finds a home lord here we are teach us to love mercy with humble hearts we bow down at your throne so come so come move let justice roll on like a river let worship turn into revival lord lead us back to you come move so come move let justice roll on like a river let worship turn into revival lord lead us back to you king of all generations let every tongue and nation surrender all to you alone king of all generations let every tongue and nation surrender all to you alone to you alone so come move let justice roll on like a river let worship turn into revival lord lead us back to you so come move let justice roll on like a river let worship turn into revival Lord, lead us back to you. Lead us back to you. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty Early in the morning My soul shall rise to Thee Holy, holy, holy God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee. Casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee. Which word and are Evermore shall be holy, 
just and you are holy in the world of injustice and darkness lord we look to you for our hope you are hope you are light jesus and i pray that we would embody that to our brothers and sisters right now that they would see something in us that's just so different than what's going on right now and that you would use every circumstance um every trial, Lord, to, to bring us closer to you and to allow others that, that don't know you to come to know you, Lord. And we thank you for the power in your name. Pray that we would trust you even when it doesn't make sense. Lord, I thank you that your ways are perfect. And I pray today that you would give us open hearts and open minds, Lord, to receive the message you have for us. I pray that we wouldn't only hear it, but that we would live it in action, that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, that, but that we would be doers, God. And um, I thank you in advance for what you're going to do today. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy Lord's Day. It's good to be with you this morning. I am fighting some sort of cold, which probably half of us are. Um, so I apologize in advance if I've got sniffles uh, during today, but we're going to make it through. So I'm six feet away from Josh. We'll be okay. Um, hey, we're in the middle of a series, Life is a Garden. And just a reminder, if you ever need the resources or need to hear the lessons again, you can go to our website, newgarden.church slash 2022. Today, we're, we're going to cover a lot of scripture and so if you want to go back this week and kind of meditate on all these different passages that we're going to look at, again, you can go to the website and all the slides are currently posted. If you want to follow along on your phone, you can do that as well. So life is a garden. We started in Genesis chapter 1. And again, brief reminder, Genesis 1 paints a large scale picture of God's establishment of cosmic order with his divine images who represent his rule so that the world becomes sacred space for his presence to dwell. Then you move into Genesis chapter 2, and you get a, a different creation narrative of God creating human, of him being alone, which is not good, and God creating this um, Azer Konegdo, this, uh, this savior, helper, 
who will come alongside and rule alongside the human in this perfect unity, ruling over all of creation. And so that, that, that kind of sets you up for this, again, this ideal of what humanity and creation could be, living together in unity with one another, in unity with the created world, and in unity with the creator. But as we looked at last week, that storyline, it doesn't stay that way forever. And so uh, as we've been following along kind of this, uh, this narrative arc, we've made it through humanity being created and placed in the garden, man and cre- uh, woman created unified. Last week, we looked at the dialogue between the, the snake and the woman, and the, the woman and the man eat from the forbidden tree. Today, we're going to be in this, this next section, this dialogue between God and the humans. Next week, we'll look at the consequences, and then finally, what it's like for humanity in this new uh, exile and banishment from the garden. So if you weren't here last week, um, we looked at the first seven verses in chapter three, which tell the story of the temptation of the snake um, to Eve, or the woman, of this, this tree that she's been told, listen, you can eat from every tree in the garden. Apparently, every tree was producing good fruit that looked good, that tasted good, and um, and if you're if you're an outdoors outdoorsy person, you know maybe you know what you can and can't eat out in the woods. But for others of us, we see you know berries and we're like, I don't know that berry looks kind of like that berry over there, and I, I I need somebody to tell me, hey, this one is it's good. This one it will kill you. Don't eat that. And um, and so apparently that's what. Yahweh does. He says, listen, good, 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 good. Like, they're all good. But there's this one tree that's, it's not good. You just have to trust me. Um, If you eat of it, the consequences to follow will not be good. In fact, death will follow. But the serpent sneaks into the picture, uses his wisdom um, in a negative way, and and put that, that seed of doubt in the woman's mind so that he, she and the, the human are led to the tree and they look and it looks good, right? It looks like all the other fruit. And so why can't I take it for myself? And that's exactly what Adam and Eve both do. And so they find out their eyes are opened, see that they're naked. They somehow sew leaves together. At, Laura asked me last week, like, how do they sew them together? I don't know. I looked in commentaries. Nobody really touches that that I've seen. But, um, th- but that's what they do. They have this new wisdom, and, and it leads to this awareness of, oh, like there's the shame, this covering that happens. And so now we're going to step into kind of the next, the next kind of narrative picture, starting with verse 8. Now they, the human and his woman or his wife, they heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. Then Yahweh, God, called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He, the man, said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he, God, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave me uh, gave to be with me She gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then Yahweh God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So a lot going on here. Maybe hopefully the first thing that kind of uh, jumps out is this back and forth. Back and forth. It's it's much like the the previous uh, picture of the serpent talking to Eve. The serpent speaks... Eve responds. The serpent speaks. Eve responds. The serpent speaks. But now we have Yahweh acting. You you have Yahweh coming in. The sound is is there. The humans respond by hiding. Yahweh asks a question. The the human responds. Yahweh asks another question. The woman responds. And so it's this back and forth. And so what what I want to do is look at a couple things and um, real quickly. So they hear the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So this, there's, there's different ideas of what this is, right? And, and different ideas of how they knew what this was like. But this sound of, of God um, gets picked up in other places in Scripture. And it's not always a gentle thing. It's not just you, 
you kind of hear some gentle person walking through the garden. It, it's, it's equated a lot of times to Mount Sinai, where the people see the sound of Yahweh and the lightning and the fire, and they are afraid because they, they realize how awesome the presence of God is compared to themselves. And so they're fearful and they tell Moses, Moses, you go, you know, you, you go on up, you talk to him, we'll stay here, you come back and, you know, and talk to us. And so it, it's almost, you get this picture of this sound is a bit scary. It's like a thunderstorm rolling into the woods. The trees start to blow and, and you feel that, maybe, maybe that coolness, you know, that kind of falls on, and you're like, a storm is coming. And so you kind of anticipate a storm is brewing, that, that Yahweh storms into the scene almost. And, um, and the cool of the day, it's, it's literally the wind of the day. It's the same word, ruach, that you find in Genesis 1-2 of the Spirit of God hovering over the, the waters. And so, you know, it could, it's not necessarily a time of day. It could be the evening. It could be the morning. Um, but it is this presence of this, this wind moving um, throughout the trees of the garden. And then the, the other thing that I want to highlight is this Yahweh God walking. I heard the sound of you walking in the garden. And it's like a, the, the verb here is it's, it's called a reflexive, but it's like a continuous um, thing that happens over and over, you know, like we're, we're used to what this is. And so walking is it's this picture of Yahweh walking about or strolling in the garden, waiting for the humans to join him. And it's a powerful image of divine and human intimacy idealized in the garden, the righteous of later generations who live outside of Eden are those who walk or stroll with Yahweh. That is, they relate to God in the Eden ideal. And so apparently it's like this picture of Yahweh continues to show up and just kind of walk in the garden. And the humans, maybe before, have just joined him. And, you know, they, they're going down the greenway. They're walking, they're talking, they're spending time together. And it's this picture of an, an intimate relationship where you know, that's some of the best times Jenna and I have. We don't have the distractions of children or the distractions of work. And it's like, hey, let's just go on a walk. You know, you walk with somebody on the beach or you walk through the desert. You walk through wherever it is. And it's just this intimate picture of relationship. And so it's like Yahweh shows up for this walk. But who doesn't show up? The humans. They are hiding from God for some reason. But as you read through the rest of Scripture... Again, this picture of walking with God continues to show up over and over. So here's just a few of them. So in Genesis chapter 5, we find Enoch. Enoch lived 65 years and fathered Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he fathered Methuselah. And he fathered other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. You, you read the next chapter and there's all these bad things are happening, everybody is evil, but there's one guy who finds favor in the eyes of the Lord, Noah. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was righteous, he was blameless, and one of the reasons, it's because he walked with God. He, sh he took strolls with God, right? Um, later, you find God calling Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and Abram, he does a lot of good stuff, he does some negative stuff. And so eventually God comes to him and he's like, now Abram was 99 years old and Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, listen, I am God Almighty. Walk with me. You know, <laughs> Take strolls with me and be blameless. So he, he, it's not just Abram just does it. God has to just tell Abram, like, walk with me. Um, in Leviticus, you find God saying, so I will turn towards you and make you fruitful and multiply you and I will confirm my covenant with you. This is the the Israel. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. So the people, they, they exit uh, Egypt, and God gives them instructions to build this tabernacle, which was in the very center of the camp. And it was a way to show that God's presence was with them, that God was, was there with them. At Deuteronomy, you actually get some laws that say, um, it's about um, uh, bodily excrement. It's like there's a place that you are supposed to go do that because 
Yahweh walks in the camp. He doesn't want to step in all that. Like, so you go, you go put that in a certain place because Yahweh walks among you. He's with you. In Deuteronomy 10, he also says, And now, Israel, what does Yahweh your God require of you? But to fear Yahweh your God and to walk in all his ways and love him and to serve Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep Yahweh's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Later, when they um, build the temple and they're dedicating the temple, this is what Solomon says. So Solomon stood before the altar of Yahweh in the presence of the assembly of Israel. And he spread out his hands towards heaven and he said, Yahweh, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping the covenant and showing faithfulness to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You who have kept with your servant, my father David, that which you promised him. You have spoken with your mouth and you have fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Now then, Yahweh, God of Israel, keep with your servant David, my father, that which you have promised him, saying, you shall not be deprived of a man to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your sons are careful about their way to walk before me as you have walked. And then maybe one of the favorite Bible verses, Micah 6, 8, maybe one of the only verses from the minor prophets that we probably could quote. <clears throat> and he has told you, mortal one, what is good? And what does Yahweh require of you? Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. And then you, even into the New Testament, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he says, we are the temple of the living God. Just as God has said, I will dwell among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will shall be my people. So again, all this, this picture in the very you know, opening pages of a God who seeks out an intimate relationship with his people. One that it's, it's not, um, it, it's unencumbered by all of the, the things else going on. It's like drop all of that and just spend time walking with me. And so the question I, I have to ask myself, and, and I ask all of us, reading that and reading all of these pictures of these faithful, righteous people, the, the consistent thing in their life is they, they walked with God. So how, how are you? How am I walking with God? Is that a, a normal routine in my life? You know, I Typically, I put on, if, I, if I go on a walk, which is rare, you know, I put on headphones and I listen to podcasts or I do something. Um, trying to get, get input, but I think there is a lot of um, value in taking the ear pods out and just walking and saying, God, I want to walk with you today. You know, it's almost like a, a physical prayer life. If I, I'm active and I'm, I'm somehow, I don't understand how you're with me, but I know that you are, and just, you know, I just want to be with you. I'm going to dedicate this time to just be with you. And, uh, you know, we even sing. If we pull out the old imaginary hymn books, maybe you can, if, if you're old school like me, you could sing along. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He walks with me. He talks with me. The joy I get, nobody would understand that. They don't know what it means to walk with God, but I understand. So this week, what's, what's a time maybe we could set aside? Um, and if, if it's not a long physical walk, just a time to, to be present with God. Because I think he shows up in different moments to walk with us. And I think sometimes we're busy or we're hiding um, and we're not present to be available to him. So they hear the sound of Yahweh God walking in the cool of the day or the wind of the day. And the man and his wife, they hide themselves from the presence of Yahweh among the trees of the garden. I don't know if they climbed a tree, maybe, you know, they're like up in a tree, I don't know. But it's interesting how trees continue to play such a pivotal role. They're surrounded by trees, they're Two trees, one leads to life, one leads to the knowledge of good and evil. They take from one, they cover themselves like they are a tree. Now they're hiding amongst the trees, 
all in this, this garden. And Yahweh, he comes, he comes storming in, it seems like, but his, the voice, the, the words he chooses, I think are more of the gentle, compassionate, fatherly, where are you? Like we, uh, parents, we understand this. You know, like your, pre- your, your, your children have done something wrong. They probably know it. And just your presence entering the room has this weight. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. But you can come in as a force to be reckoned with. But what comes out of your mouth next will decide how this situation goes, right? You can lay the hammer and lay the judgment and send them to their room or make them do this or, you know, chastise them, make them put them in their place. Or you can invite them into that relationship of like, listen, I love you, I care for you, but let's talk about this. What happened? And I think this is exactly the picture we get. God shows up and he just he asks the question, hey, where, where are you? Like normally you, you show up and you're with me. What? Not that he doesn't know. I mean, I think he knows where they are. He knows what has happened, but he is inviting them into the relationship. The, that God's first response to humans' failure is to seek them out and pursue relationship with them. That it's not laying the hammer of justice. It is an invitation to respond to a a loving, kind creator. And thankfully, this picture we get here, it's not the the only time that God does this. That God's first response um, is not a one-time thing. This is God's fundamental response to human failure. Pursuit of relationship and invitation to come out of hiding. And so Yahweh asks, where are you? Who told you? What have you done? Just questions, questions, invitations. Like, I I want you to realize where you are. And it may be, you know, so often we go to God for answers, but I think so often God just gives us questions just to help prod us into that, actually, where, where am I? It's not a simple, well, I'm over here in the trees, but it's a like, why am I here? What have I done? Have I reckoned with the actions that I chose to do? You know, like, have I allowed myself to process all all that is going to happen because of what I've done? And where is my heart in that? Is it a blame game? Well, listen, the the woman, oh, the serpent, or am I going to, you know, take um, responsibility for my actions? Um, but again, this isn't the, the first time, and we'll just we'll go through a few of these questions. But I, I was struck this week at just how often God just asks questions. Again, an invitation into a relationship. Uh, you turn the page in Genesis chapter 4, and you find these two brothers, and um, they bring sacrifices to God. And, and God looks on favor at Abel's, and he doesn't with Cain's. And Cain becomes angry, and God, uh, this is what he says. So Cain became very angry, and his face was gloomy. And Yahweh said, why are you angry? Why is your face gloomy? If you do well, will your face not be cheerful? If you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Now Cain talked to his brother Abel, and it happened that when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And Yahweh said to Cain, where? Where is your brother Abel? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And Yahweh says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Again, God knows, but again, I think it's, it's an invitation. Um, later on in the story, you find God choosing Abram and his son Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob is just a deceiver from the beginning. His, his name means deceiver. And God continues to say, listen, Jacob is going to be blessed. Jacob is going to be the leader. And Jacob continues to try to steal and to take and to like, put himself in a position instead of just allowing God to, to place him there. But eventually, Jacob comes to a place where he wrestles with this man who ends up being um, God. But, so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket, or maybe struck the socket of Jacob's hip, 
and the socket of Jacob's hip was dislocated while he wrestled with him, but he still didn't let go. And the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so the man said, what is your name? Again, a question. What is, what is your name? Who have you been? And he said, my name is Yaakov, deceiver, tripper. I grab people's ankles and I make them fall. That's who I am. And the man said, you are no longer Yaakov, but Israel struggles with Yahweh. For you have contended with God and with men and have prevailed. Who are you? I'm going to take the answer to that and I'm going to lead you into a new life. And Jacob becomes the namesake for all the people of Israel. In Exodus chapter 4, um, the people are enslaved and God calls Moses. And Moses, you know, he's this bumbling guy. I can't do it. I don't know. I don't know. I can't talk well. You know, I need help. All this stuff, sort of stuff. And God says, I'll be with you. You know, I am who I am and I am with you. And Moses is like, how will they know? And um, he says, what if I, I go and they don't believe me or they listen to me and, and um, they say, listen, Yahweh has not appeared to you. But Yahweh said to him, hey, what's in your hand? In other words, what, what do you have right now that I can work with? I know you have all these excuses. Let's lay them aside and just work with what you have. What's in your hand? He said, a staff. And Yahweh said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground. It turned into a serpent. Moses runs away. But Yahweh said to Moses, hey, reach out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he reached out his hand and caught it, and it turned into a staff with his hand. So they may believe that Yahweh, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, has appeared to you again. <clears throat> before instruction of what to do, God asks a question and invites Moses into what's going to happen. In 1 Kings chapter 19, again, one of these famous stories, um, Elijah has just confronted the prophets of Baal, and they've had that big thing, and Elijah's been making fun of them, like, oh, maybe Baal's in the bathroom, you know, and, and Elijah has called down fire from heaven. It consumes all the fire, all the altar and everything. But then he runs away. Because uh, the queen is like, I'm going to kill Elijah. So he's had this big, awesome event, and then he, he runs away. So he goes into this cave, and God said, uh, what are you doing? Go out. Go out of the cave. I'm going to meet with you. So go out and stand on the mountain before Yahweh. And behold, Yahweh was passing by. And a great and powerful wind was tearing out the mountains and breaking the rocks in pieces before Yahweh. But Yahweh was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But Yahweh was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But Yahweh was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out, and he stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Have you ever had that, have you ever had that moment in your life? Maybe you had a spiritual high, and then you kind of nosedive into a place where you're like, How did I get here? And you just hear the voice of God speaking to you and saying, what are you doing here? Why are you in hiding? Why are you, why are you, why are you so far away from where you're supposed to be? Again, not, what are you, do? you know, like that frustrated parent, like, what are you doing? But I think a gentle, like, what are you doing? Let's talk, let's, let's talk about it. You get to Job. Job has this crazy encounter um, throughout his life. He's, he gets tested. His friends are questioning him. He doesn't know what's going on. And finally he turns to God, like accusing God. And this is God's response. Yahweh answered Job from the whirlwind again and said, Who is this who darkens the divine plan by words without knowledge? <laughs> I'm going to say that one for Finn. I think that would be good when he's like questioning me. Who is this that darkens the divine plan by words without knowledge? Now, tighten the belt of your waist like a man, and I shall ask you, and you inform me, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Has God ever asked you this kind of question? When I think I know more than God, I think I know a better way, a better plan than God does, and God's saying, okay, Jeff, where were you 39 years ago? You weren't even here. 
I've been, I've been here from the foundations of the earth. Like, you can trust me. So sometimes God has to put us in our place. In Isaiah chapter 6, in the year King Uzziah's death, I saw Yahweh sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim were standing above him, each having six wings. With two, they covered its face. With two, their feet. Two, they flew. And one called out to another. We sang this a minute ago. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then the, the, the seraphim flies and touches Isaiah's lips because he's like, I'm unclean, I'm going to die. But I heard the voice of Yahweh saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. Has God ever asked you this question? Who's going who's gonna to go with, who's going to go for me? Will you be involved in what I'm doing? Ezekiel chapter 7, the hand of Yahweh um, was upon me. He brought me out by the Spirit of Yahweh. He set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He had me pass among them all around. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were dry, all these dry bones. And he asks me, son of man, can these bones live? Like, do you believe? Do you have faith? Who could do this? And he says, I, I, I don't know. You know, God. If anybody can do it, you can do it. You get to the New Testament, and Jesus comes on the scene. There's other ones we didn't talk about. Jonah, uh, most of the prophets, all these questions that get asked, but you get to Jesus. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself the power had gone out from him, he's among this crowd, this woman who's been sick, touches him, gets healed, and he turns around, and instead of just pointing out, you, I know it was you, he invites, who, who touched my garments? Who's, who is here for healing? Come to me, right? And his disciples are like, how do you, who, why are you asking this? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this, but the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened, came, fell down before him, told him the whole truth. And he said, listen, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be cured of your disease. Jesus invites the woman into the relationship. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus asks his disciples a question. They're going out to Caesarea Philippi on the way. He said, hey, who do people say that I am? They said, well, some say John the Baptist, maybe Elijah, other prophets, and then, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Christ. And he warned them not to tell anybody about him. Has you ever had to answer this question? Who do you say that Jesus is? Most of us, I think, in here would say, He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. Maybe others, we, we haven't answered that for ourselves and it hasn't impacted our lives. Or maybe it's impacted it incorrectly because it continues. Peter, he gets the answer right, but he gets the application wrong. And so Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise from the dead. And he was stating the matter plainly and Peter takes him aside, began to rebuke Jesus. But turning around, seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but on man's. And then he summoned everybody together with his disciples. And he says, Listen, if anybody wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And then he asks a question. What does it benefit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what could a person give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. So over and over, God asks people questions, invites them. Jesus asks people questions, invites them. And he asks us the same question and invites us. Maybe, he, maybe today he's asking you, where are you? Come take strolls with me. Where have you been? Maybe there's something that you're trying to hide. You're not, you know, and he's saying, what, what have you done? What have you done? Maybe some of you are being hesitant. And he's saying, listen, who, who's going to go for me? 
Maybe some of us are angry, and we're like, oh, and he's like, listen, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Okay? Trust me. I'm bigger than this. Maybe, who, who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? Maybe it's, what are you, what are you trying to get, what are you trading for eternal life? What, what is there to trade for eternal life? But he sits down with his disciples and he says plainly, listen, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die, but I'm going to be raised for three days. God's going to rob the grave. and I'm going to come out triumphant. And each week we come to a table and we meet with Jesus. And so I don't know what question Jesus needs to ask you today. But I pray that the Spirit whispers that question in your ear. And that you can stroll with God this week as you work through the answers. So I want to pray for us. And we've got three tables, two in the front, one in the back. And um, if there's somebody you need to process that with next to you, feel free to spend time doing that. But um, let's just go to the tables and meet with Jesus and stroll with God this week. Let's pray. Father, I thank you um, that you're, you're not a God that just comes in and demands. Um, you're not a father who comes in and just hands, hands us the answers and expects us to just accept that and move on. But you are a creator who invites us into a partnership to walk with you, to grow with you. Um, and you. And you take the first step. You enter into the garden of our lives. You don't even wait for us to come to you. You entered into creation as, as this human, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so God, today as we go to the table, I pray we meet with you and that whatever question you need to ask us, we are ready to listen to. We love you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's go to the table together.
Let's worship together as we close today. And let's just receive this blessing um, from God to us as his kids. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let's sing that again. The Lord bless you. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen, 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 Amen. Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace amen and amen amen Amen, we believe in the Amen, Amen, Amen. His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children. And their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence Go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, within you. He is with you, He is with you in the morning, in the evening, and you're coming, and you're going, and you're weeping, and rejoicing. He is for you, He is for you, He is for you, He is for you, He is for you. He is for you, He is for you, He is for you, oh. And amen, 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 Numbers chapter 6, um, Yahweh is giving all these rules and laws and provisions and stuff, and then he, he speaks 
to Moses and said, Say to Aaron, the, the priest, and his sons, the other priests, um, in this way, you shall bless the children of Israel. You're to say to them, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift his face to you and give you peace. And so they, the priests, shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. So let us go bear the name of Yahweh well this week as we walk with God. So have a great week. See you next week.